Hello and welcome to Postgres FM, a weekly show about all things PostgreSQL. I am Michael, founder of PG Mustard. This is my co-host Nikolai, founder of Postgres AI. Hello, Nikolai. What are we talking about today? Hi, Michael. Uh, we wanted to talk about one of my favorite topics, massive delete, I, I usually call it, but maybe you can call it some, somewhat, somehow differently. So Yeah, I, I really like this. So de- when you say massive delete, do you mean deleting a lot of rows all at once? Um, right, in one SQL statement. So, for example, 10 million rows, 1 billion row, or just 1 million. It's good already. Good enough to feel how bad this is for Postgres. So we can discuss in detail what's happening if you do it. I like this type of thing because it's not only bad, it's also good. And we can explore that as well, because uh, if you do it on production, it's bad. But if you do it on purpose in some testing environment, it can be very helpful. Oh, I see what you mean. So it's a useful tool for certain things. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I get it. Stress test. For, yeah. So you, you mentioned this in a previous episode, uh, that it would be good to cover this in more detail. And I was really interested. But... I think it's important to say what we're not going to cover as well. So massive deletes, some people might also be thinking of like some other it, things that sound like deletes, like some people often implement soft deletes, which uh, would be like implemented via updates. We're not going to talk about that kind of thing. We're right. talking uh, about only actual Postgres deletes at this point. And some people complain why soft deletes are not uh, already implemented by default uh, in database system like natively by by there maybe it's a good idea to to have but, but yeah, yeah we will skip this topic so delete yeah. maybe it's another episode because it mm-hmm. has interesting nuances yeah but let's let's talk about uh, what's happening if you want to delete many many rows uh, how to do it correctly on production not to put your database on knees and uh, how to use it in non-production environments for something good for good reasons Right. I like it. Do you want to start? Maybe with some use cases. Like, what, when are you generally seeing people do these like huge deletes? Um, I've oh. got a few examples I've seen, but I'd be interested in yours. Well, usually people do massive delete by mistake, <laughs> not understanding how Postgres works. Sure. And MVCC and so on. And they expect it's a simple operation. They probably saw some warning that. You shouldn't expect immediate reduction of uh, disk space used. For example, you delete from some table and think, okay, I will free some space. No, you won't free some space because it's only part of the work. Another part is auto, auto vacuum, which will need to ac- actually delete that tuples. But uh, well, yeah, what? And even then, you're not, you won't see, and you, if you're monitoring disk space, you won't see that as free space uh, again. So it depends. So you... It depends. Auto vacuum also can truncate a relation if okay, uh, sure. if uh, some page in the end is deleted. All all tuples are deleted and vacuumed, so physically deleted already. Right, uh, if page becomes free. It will truncate it and it will reclaim disk space. Yeah. Okay. But I feel like those cases are are the exception rather than the norm. I I see a lot more cases where people Mm. are deleting a subset of data from a non-partition table and really surprised when when their relation doesn't decrease in size. But just to cover like a few of the other basics, I I think this is actually a topic that's coming up more and more because we have these like new privacy laws that require people to be able to like to have the right to be forgotten. And deleting data is, is quite a safe way of not, having a data leak like if the less data you have the less data that can be leaked security wise so there's the, i feel like there's these forcing functions i think also people are starting to get serious about having data retention policies so how long should we keep each type of data around for so i think there are some of these use cases that mean this is coming up more and in the past at least in the last 10 years i saw a lot more people kind of just storing everything forever and not really thinking about it so I, I didn't know if this is something you're seeing more often or it's just a, an age-old problem. Well, yes. So I think GDPR and everything, it's not that big because, uh, you know, like 
well, single user delete it's it's not it's usually like some fraction of the whole right but uh, usually massive delete happens when we, we need to clean up and we understand there's some old data which is not super useful we pay for it and uh, we need like we want to postpone the moment when we need to scale our instances database instances uh, machines and so on in this case uh, like in general i would like to mention before before covid i went to vldb conference which is like conference i know since my since being a kid basically mm -hmm. almost when i was a student learning database theory and so on I, i've heard about it this conference so i went it I went to it because it was, it was very close uh, in, in Los Angeles. And I remember a keynote, some researcher, she, she was presenting the talk, which was interesting. It was about delete, basically. She, she said, this is exponential growth of the total data volumes of data in our databases in the world. It was like, phew. Uh, because uh, storage becomes cheaper, we produce like a lot of data, like big data, huge data, and so on. Like this is like some zettabytes or something like it's insane curve, insane with some forecast. And she said we spent decades to learn how to store properly CID, not to lose data, reliable, highly available, and so on. Now it's it's coming time to learn how to clean up and delete understand which data can be safely delete, how to delete it efficiently, and so on. And I was super inspired. I also did a talk at a conference because at, around the same time I had production incident, very a senior engineer, backend engineer, with good understanding of analytical databases actually, got a task to delete some the old data, preparing for some marketing campaign because like forecast was saying, we either need to invest a lot or, or to upgrades or we need to clean up before we do this huge marketing campaign. So <laughs> he went to the production and just performed delete from table where created at older than one year. He estimated in advance that it will be 10 million rows. And we got an incident downtime, more than 10 minutes costed company a lot of money. I was like, I was super impressed, a lot of money. And he almost left the company himself because he was super embarrassed. And and this was at, like, at the same time, this VLDB conference about delete and this, like I, I, I'm saying, like we need something, right? We need, uh, at least we need to educate people that delete should be split to batches. Of course, uh, if you have good disk, maybe you'll be fine. But in that case, we had quite slow. It was, it was some uh, enterprise level, but some Sun, I think, or some some uh, old system it was on premise. And also at the same time, I was advocating this company. Like I, I was, I was helping them as a consultant with Postgres. Company was growing super fast, huge startup. And I was uh, saying, guys, you do need to increase max wall size. One gigabyte is not enough. So with default setting max wall size, untuned check pointer and quite slow storage, I think uh, maximum throughput for writes was maybe 600 megabytes per second, maybe 500. It's not like current modern NVMe, which gives you like two gigabytes per second, for example. These two factors plus the, the idea, let's delete 10 million rows, it's not, it's not a huge number, right? So it, no, it put, so. yeah, checkpoint became crazy because a lot of what what's happening. First of all, we find rows. I mean, executor finds yeah. rows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it was also unfortunate that it was not sequential pattern. So what like rows were ordered by according to created at. So they they start sparsely, and first you need to put. Postgres needs to put X max value to this hidden system column. It needs to put current transaction, which deletes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, value to X max column for first row, and the page becomes dirty. Right? Dirty means in memory we have different page than on disk. So we have some, we need to 
flush it to disk eventually. Uh, it, it, checkpointer needs to do it, yeah. uh, basically, right? And then different row was different tuple, basically, physical row, right? Version of row in different page. So we dirty different page. So almost like if you have, if you need uh, to update Xmax in 100 rows, it's like almost 100 pages already dirty. Very inefficiently already because of this pattern of random, random access basically. It's not random, but it's not sequential. This is this is the key, right? And then checkpointer sees, okay, I'm I have max max wall size one gigabyte, and it was Postgres, I think nine nine five nine six. At mm -hmm. that time, it means that real distance between two checkpoints was three times lower, oh, only yeah. three hundred megabytes. You can read uh, in the Igor Rogov's book Postgres internals very good explanation mentioning uh, the improvements and like why it's not really ma even max wall size but but three times sm smaller now i think it's either two times smaller or something i already don't remember so it means that check pointer comes and says okay it's time already we, we already accumulated too many buffers dirty we need to put like to flush them to page cache f first of all and then PD flash pro like something something like PD flash will will go and flash them to disk, so it starts working producing a lot of I/O and it, it converts to real disk I/O already, and then, boom, different row happens to this uh, to be in the same page which just flashed, it was just flashed, it it already clean but we update it again. I mean we update different tuple in the same page it becomes dirty again, right? And checkpointer says okay. Again, a lot of work. So it's duplicate, duplicating effort by flushing too excessively. Yeah. Is that what? You, yeah. 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 So checkpoint or distance between checkpoints was like I remember now, like was like twenty seconds only. Yeah, yeah. Also, I learned that it's like is if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, I think many years already passed. Checkpoints can overlap sometimes oh, man, man. for a couple of seconds. Like it's still happening, but it's very time. To, it's insane. So checkpoint produced a lot of I/O and this couldn't handle this I/O, and database became unresponsive, unre unre and we had critical incident like basically downtime, failovers and so like it's insane. Everything be became insane, and downtime was huge, and that's not good, right? But as I remember, there are two effects. Not only you need to flush the same page multiple times if you have this non-sequential uh, pattern access pattern, but also once checkpoint uh, checkpointer or anything else made the page clean, we have different effect. Uh, full full page images. Yes, yes. So full mm -hmm. page images, full page rights. So since full page rights is on, it means that after checkpoint, if we visit with our change our delete this page again it goes in full to the wall right whereas if it was in a previous if it, if it had managed to sneak into the previous before the check the, the next checkpoint it would have been a much smaller amount of work yeah yeah if we had for example huge uh, a maximal size like 100 gigabytes mm -hmm. we have enough disk space we can afford it we understand if we crash startup time will be longer Replica provisioning also takes longer because like to reach recovery po point with takes time, minutes. Yeah. And then in this case, we understand. And then in this case, even if we have random, not random, almost like not sequential access pattern, we visit the same page multiple times, not sequentially. And not only check pointer will flush it just once instead of multiple times, but also the, only the first change will go uh, to the wall as a full page. But mm -hmm. subsequent changes will be just presented as a tuple. Mm -hmm. And this, right. it, it means wall volume generation decreases significantly if, if yeah. we do this. So it was helpful to me as a, as a consultant because I finally found uh, agreement that we need uh, checkpoint tuning. I, it was the uh, begin, beginning of my practice in the US, so it was hard to me to find good arguments. But like this case showed, okay, I just did very good uh, series of experiments. I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of experiments. So if you just start experimenting with Maxwell size and run deletes each time, you just do this one gigabyte. This is the IO for this massive delete. Like 
2 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes, you know, logarithmic approach. Mm -hmm. You reach 64, for example, or 128 gigabytes, and you can draw a good curve, right? Just look how I.O. And usually I.O., if you also have monitoring, if this delete takes like a minute, or two minutes, five minutes, you can see in monitoring that you have plateau for I.O. Because it's saturated. Mean- are you taking the total IO? So let's say you're take you're doing the same delete each time, and you're looking at total IO across the time, and showing that there's less IO as as we increase the. I just, time. yeah, I just, well, uh, I did several things in this experiment, and I think it's <laughs> worth maybe a good how to article or or something. Actually, it was two phases, two two parts of the whole experiment. First is to study this uh, IO behavior and checkpointer behavior. So I did snapshot of PG, um, PG style PG writer, which as we know until recent version contains not only PG, background writer, but also checkpointer and backend uh, activity for cleaning dirty buffers. So I converted as usual, I converted buffers to gigabytes because this is how uh, any engineer can start understanding what's happening. Yeah. If you say buffers, uh, nobody understands except DBAs, right? If you convert, if you multi, if, if you multiply it by eight kibibytes, you have gibibytes, gi- megabytes. You, you, everyone is, starts understanding. So I just showed that with default setting, checkpointer had a lot of IO and also PG start wall. M- much more wall was generated, but I also mm-hmm. made screenshots of monitoring showing that we had plateau saturating disk I.O., disk, disk write I.O. But when we had already like 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, we already see like like spiky pattern up and down, and this is good. It means because we have room. batches? Why, yeah. why is it spiky? Yeah, some batching, something like, uh, yeah, checkpoint, it's also like, it's all called, of course, checkpoint completion target, it's like close to one, so it should be spread, but it, it's like, this is batching there, obviously. Got it. And this is good. We're not saturated. Plato is bad. <laughs> right, so. Actually, it's a good point that this helps, this optimizer, like, tuning the checkpoint is helping with massive deletes, regardless of whether we batch or not. It's helping in the case where we don't batch, and it's helping in the case where we do batch. Is that right? right? Well, right now I'm talking only about how we would, tuning, how tuning would prevent this incident. I think it would be, it would. I think it would convert P1 or priority one or criticality one incident to P2. So basically we, we have, we, but database is slow, but it's not, it's not down. Mm. Yeah. Great. Because, because, uh, because we just discussed this, uh, much less wall produced checkpointer has less IO to perform. Okay. Great. I understand the yeah. spikiness now. We're talking about that's when the checkpoints are happening. Yeah. Ch- the IO from checkpointer. Great, great, great. This IO was spiky and it's good. That means we are not having plateau. We are not saturated. Of course, mm-hmm. better if you know your numbers, you know the limit of IO you, your device, sure, storage sure. device can handle. And you can draw this line on on graph and understand how far. Like, basically, regular SRE practices uh, starting from uh, use usage saturation errors should be applied here to, mm-hmm. to to study this incident and perform root cause analysis. And this was great. It was obvious that if we reach like sixteen gigabytes or thirty two gigabytes, we are in much better shape. We just need to have disk IO and also second phase of experiment. I think we, we, we had an episode about um, maximum size did. and checkpointer tuning. So second phase, I won't go to, into detail there, but second phase of you, you do need to understand uh, recovery time in the worst situation. And I invented the term like double worst situation, double unlucky. So worst situation, if you database crashed right before checkpoint completes. Yeah. And double unlucky if at the same time you had massive delete or something like that. In this case, it means uh, yeah a lot of uh, work during recovery. So yeah, that's it actually. This is uh, how massive delete looks like in in the wild, and you should avoid it. Yeah. So what? How do we then go from the? I guess we've gone from priority one incident to priority two. How do we make this not an incident at all? Batching. So just split it to batches. I think there, there might be cases when logically 
you cannot afford splitting two batches because you must uh, delete everything in one transaction. But in my in my practice, uh, I never saw this. I mean, I always could convince people to split two batches and, and do do everything in, in different transactions. So yeah. I, in this case, we need just to understand what is the ideal batch size for us. Not too small, not too big. Too small means too, a lot of transaction overhead. Too big, we just discussed. Yeah, but ideally, I, uh -huh. I was going to say I haven't seen a delete use case that need, like we're deleting stuff, right? We don't need it anymore. That's almost by definition we don't need it anymore. So why well, do you, why would you need it to all be gone or none of it to be gone? It doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. Potentially, there might be a case when you don't want users to see part parts of the old. Okay. Data. Right. But so they want, case, you want them goal, to not see anything, but you'd rather they saw everything than than part of it. Yeah, in this case, go and so. adjust uh, application logic so the the application cannot reach that data already, right? Even That's if it's idea. present in yeah. database, but you hide it already. Maybe that, like that, based on timestamps or something. So, but again, this is just a theoretical discussion. I, in practice, I didn't see any cases when we couldn't. Like the benefits for Postgres with its MVCC model, benefits from batch deletes always much higher than like experiencing this pain and risks. So yeah, bat batches and we know the ideal size of batches we discussed it many, many times starting from the, the very first episode we had almost two years ago. So And very recently in the don't do yeah. this episode, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So ideal, my recipe is just try to be below one second, but maybe not below 100 milliseconds or 50. So this is ideal size to me based on human perception. Yeah, you mentioned something in the recent episode about it degrading over time. So let's say you, you can you get a clone or, or you, you have a, a replica of production where you're testing yeah. batch sizes and you get the sweet spot. Maybe you find out that you can delete 5,000 rows in just under a second. And you think, let's go with 5,000 as the yeah. batch size. You and mentioned one hour case, later, yeah, yeah. One hour later, you see you, the same delete already takes one minute. What's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah so I was going to ask, uh, not only what's causing it, but how would you, like, do you run the test for longer? Or like, how do you, how do you think about that stuff? Well, you just need to understand that when you delete or update, you produce that tuples, and it means that only the first part of, of two parts uh, of the operation is done. It's done synchronously by your SQL query, but there is a second super important part, which is vacuuming. On, so delete is not complete when you, when you see a transaction committed. It, it, it's complete only logically, but physically we have these dead tuples basically garbage unless some transactions still need it, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to understand vacuum. And actually in the same company to perform delete properly, of course I split two batches. And then I was big fan like, oh, I want to create a simple query, which is basically stateless. I don't don't want to deal with remembering last ID or last mm -hmm. timestamp of previous batch. Basically, no window, window, how to say, pagination, no pagination. I don't want to have pagination because they have a similar problem as pagination for selects showing a huge result set split to pages to users. Similar problem here. Very similar because uh, it's the same basically problem. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to, to do something like stateless and I just relied on Postgres on some index. I checked indexes used and then already in production, I, I, I saw this degradation. So degradation was beca because of a lot of dead tuples and auto vacuum couldn't catch up with my speed of deletion. I also remember interesting things since then, since then I'm a big fan on single of single threaded maintenance jobs. I implemented multiple threads originally, but then I saw that even single thread is too fast for vacuum for auto vacuum. And we don't need uh, parallelization here. Of course, parallelization in my case was based on a select for update skip locked, like fancy, super cool. Like yeah. <laughs> it was maybe like five, six years ago, like 
like let's do fancy stuff we will we will have like five workers let's go but you don't need it here one thread is enough to to, to clean up yeah, because uh, otherwise you need to speed up vacuum somehow and vacuum for a single table is always single threaded you cannot have multiple workers cleaning up that tuples from a single physical table non partition yeah, partition yeah. or if it's partitioned mm -hmm. yes uh, they can work on multiple partitions at the same time but if it's a single table no so i want to come back to partitioning but in the meantime like so a massive delete also has a big impact on like i was thinking about index only scans not not for the delete but for other like concurrent reads because let's say we're in a situation where we are deleting a lot of tuples from not necessarily random but like lots of different pages the visibility map is going to be well there's going to be a lot of pages that have changes and therefore can't be true index only scans so i was thinking for that case we might actually want to run a vacuum manually every certain number of batches yeah this is what i did and i also thought maybe oh, you did I it, should. Right? yeah i did i did uh, manual not manual i mean my script did it yeah, every yeah. n but after n batches like 100,000 batches vacuum and how did you determine N? Ooh, good question. Well, experiments. So if you if you have if you want to go stateless, and you know a lot of data tuples will will be a problem because in the index you use on on primary key or on the creation time step created that this index uh, also needs vacuum because it will be pointing to data tuples and that's why. Subsequent batches will be slower, slower. Degradation over time will happen. Mm -hmm. But if you vacuum, this you get rid of these links to the tuples, right? And uh, it becomes good again. So based on that, uh, like observe, observe the, applying rule, we want our transactions to exceed one or two seconds because users might notice some like big bad things. And when we have a long transaction, we also block. Uh, we also uh, are some kind of a problem for all auto vacuum workers globally for our database. So if you see, oh, it degraded to two seconds, this is the right time to run vacuum, right? But I eventually chose not to do vacuum, actually. I, I this is oh. it was, I had many iterations of my solution. Yeah. And finally, I gave up and decided to go stateful. So I performed just this key set pigeonation. Just based on last timestamp, I select next batch based on that. It's super fast, even if we had a lot of dead tuples. So mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I don't care. Because AutoVacuum, well, AutoVacuum is good for skip, to skip pages it can skip. It's not like 10 or 15 years ago. It's already quite good. So multiple runs versus just single big run. This, this is a good question, by the way, worth exploring. Is it good to run vacuum quite often in this case? Versus let's run it just once. In terms of how low it will produce, in terms of how many disk operations in total, we can. Could, could, this is good experiment to conduct and compare these numbers. Well, and I, doesn't it depend a little bit on, like, I think it depends a bit on your workload, right? If you have no other concurrent users, running one vacuum is likely more efficient than running lots of small ones. But if you have other concurrent users and you're forcing heap fetches, then maybe your IO impact yeah. from those reads it like outweighs the duplicate yeah. effort on vacuum. Yeah. Or even even when I say duplicate effort on vacuum, I guess we're talking about the same yeah, you bring kind a of a point similar. Here. If we see that we want to run single vacuum not frequently, we will leave with a lot of buffers which uh, are out of visibility map. So yeah, yeah, and index only scans will degrade. But this, mm -hmm. you, add, you add complexity here. Like I know, start, I know. Like in, in, my, in my case, I don't care about other users for now. I like this approach. First, you study the problem alone, yeah. and then you start adding what you did. Like, oh, we have other users. Let's already understanding the problem, like in vacuum, so to speak, in, in like <laughs> I know <laughs> single user mode, basically, right? Yeah. Then you start adding considerations. So what about other users? So if you know how... Postgres behaves how your workload behaves for single user situation. It's already better. You are much much more confident 
when yeah. you start looking at others as well. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. We, if, you don't, if we rely on index only scans a lot, probably we should vacuum frequently to avoid hip fetches. You saw it, it in, in your plans at, at PG Master quite a lot, right? Yeah, it's quite a common one. It's not, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not the biggest issue, but it is like, especially range scans where people are doing like returning a lot of rows or doing aggregates that rely on index only scans on these kind of, you know, like hybrid workloads set kind of analytical queries. They can degrade quite quickly in certain environments. If you go from an index only scan across a few thousand pages to an index only scan with a few thousand heap fetches. Yeah, so your deletes can be a problem for these. So selects might, might, might degrade because, because visibility map is outdated. Exactly. So yeah, more frequent vacuums might be good. It's interesting discussion, interesting point as well. But in my case, I, I liked the, like, when I gave up my idea to be stateless, I liked so much, like, I just remember this value. Yeah. And remember, I just, it's, I, I degrade it also to single threaded approach. Forgetting about this uh, select for best keep locked, mm -hmm. and uh, so so I just need one value always to remember. So easy, and then performance became very predictable, reliable, stable. So yeah. all batches were we were the same size, and latencies were the same. It was like I could pre also interesting when you do it, you start thinking, oh, I want progress bar basically. I, I want to predict her ETA, how much time yeah. left. And if it's if it's degrading or not, like, not stable, this latency of each delete, you you cannot predict reliably. But uh, once yeah. you perform key set pagination here, you know your batch like it takes like three hundred milliseconds each each batch. Great, you, you, I I integrated it into my SQL uh, this progress bar. It, it report reported percentage and yeah. uh, how much left and uh, ETA. Quick, so quick question thing. on the. Like on the ordering of batches, do you try and do any kind of natural? You mentioned created that being a little bit random, but I would have expected, unless the tuples are getting updated a fair updated, amount, exactly. Yeah. Um, the created that might be relatively like it natural. Should ordering. be very good correlation between create yeah. physical location and created that. You can check it easily. Select city ID, comma yes. created that, and order by created that. Some some limit. And you can see CTID is a physical location, and you can understand how correlated physical location is with created that. In my case, it had it, it did have a lot of updates in the past, so it was like basically everywhere in the table, and okay. that's that's why incident happened actually. I yeah, think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Oh no, it was I ordered by modified at. And I even considered creating index on modify that, but this is anti pattern to me. Anti pattern yeah. to index on modified that is a problem because you start losing hot updates, heap on the tuple updates immediately because each update needs usually by trigger or something it it changes this value, and if you have an index on it, you by definition you cannot Postgres cannot implement heap on the tuple updates, and it means in, you, you need to deal with index uh, right amplification problem, which is nasty. So, so, you, so you're optimizing your delete, but you're messing up your updates. So now you are considering I, other users. I, I remember I went deeper. I, I decided, okay, honestly, I don't want this index to be built. I know it will bite me back because of hip only tuples. I don't want to lose them. I checked statistics and I saw we have good ratio of them among all updates. We have a lot of hot updates. So I decided, you know what I decided? I decided to rely on created at index, yeah. but then somehow perform logical with modified at based on partial correlation. It was something crazy. It worked quite well. I don't remember details, but I did something like some tricks there. Avoiding this, like at first I, I already coordinated index creation with guys. They said, oh yeah, let's do it. But then I said, no, 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 no. In different company, like one year before that, I already had this mistake done. I, I suggested some index and then degradation of updates happened because of we lost hot updates. Actually, this that incident 
led me to the idea we need to verify all changes holistically, checking all, all queries, ideally, what we have. And this led uh, this experimentation approach and so on. It's, it's, all, it's all connected and interesting. But yeah. maybe let's skip this and uh, since we almost uh, out of time. Yeah, if yeah. you have questions. Two more quick, two more ones. I guess they're not quick, but um, when we're done with this large delete, what do you rec like? Are, are there any kind of maintenance, tidy up tasks that you recommend doing? I, mm. I was thinking like we did a whole episode on index maintenance. I think uh, rebuilding indexes concurrently might this be is a, sensible. This question exactly is a good bridge to what I wanted to discuss as a last okay. topic. I wanted to discuss how massive delete can be used useful in non-production. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. And let's talk about this. Why your question is a bridge? Because <laughs> I. I and now I remember very well, but in my career, I, I forgot about this many, many, many times. Delete does, doesn't touch indexes at all. This is the key. So delete, they just, indexes are not touched at all during delete. Delete just puts X, X max, that's it. And if transaction is considered as committed, then a vacuum will remove this. And also if uh, no other transactions need this version, they already in the future, in this case, uh, tuple will be deleted and also links to this that tuple in this index will be deleted asynchronously by vacuum but by our backend is not dealing with indexes at all it only needs uh, to use one index to find the scope of work the the tuples we need to touch oh well also during planning as we know uh, all indexes are considered by a planner and uh, access share lock is is required so I don't see any index maintenance here at all. Well, I, I was just thinking about them being, let's say we deleted 10% of our table. Well, well, yeah, you are, I, I, you are right. Right. So if vacuum, if we don't do frequent vacuuming. Even if we, even if we do frequent vacuuming, there'll still yes. be like 10% bloat, especially if we, if we, if it's like created out or something where we're deleting yes. the old data. Yes. Vacuum doesn't rebalance B3. So. B3 will be in worse shape, probably. Yeah. If I would say if we deleted the big fraction of the table data, we probably need to consider, we, we need to check bloat in, in indexes and probably we'll need to uh, rebuild them. But I already got used to relying on automatic re rebuild jobs, which we yeah, suggest sure. implementing on weekends or something. So. But this Usually. feels like a good time to reconsider. Like anyway, it felt meant, felt yeah. worth mentioning. I know you I want to bridge to that one, but I had one more quick one, and that's like more and more. I'm thinking about some of these use cases are deleting, like a multi-tenant SaaS application wants to delete a single tenant, and if you've partitioned, like I was thinking about partitioning and detach. Like the another way of avoiding big deletes is if you have a if you can just drop a whole partition. Old so like yeah. old depending. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, like, like you know, detach. Long. Skype implemented this like three partitions for Q like yeah. workloads. Three partitions and then uh, like round robin approach uh, truncating when it's possible. It's it's much faster. Yeah, it's much faster. It's much better. No no job for many components and it's good. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I agree. I agree. But, and indexes yeah. are on partitions. They are like a physical and, and if, if it's truncated, it's also truncated. So great. Yeah. And let's, let's, let's touch a little bit last topic. Why delete is useful. Yes. So I already was like, you know, database lab and ZFS, like branching, uh, think cloning and uh, iteration starting from the idea of experimentation. It should start from the same point. In each iteration, you need to, you comparing things, you need compare apples versus apples, right? Always yeah. apples to apples. So each iteration must start from the same state of database. And this is difficult if table is huge, database is huge, and you, you want to test it on big hardware. And uh, in case of single threaded behavior, we can like, if we don't care about uh, check pointer vacuuming and so on, usually like thin clones uh, database lab engine provides are great if you just study plans and so on. But in this case, we deal with like, we need to consider uh, the same file system and we need to understand checkpointer behavior, wall, like everything. 
vacuum. So we need a dedicated clone when we we, we perform this experiment to, uh, for checkpoint tuning and uh, to study this uh, behavior. And in this case, for this tuning, I found that super cool. This kind of workload can bring us very good, interesting tool. So we just if we perform massive delete but don't commit, we, we roll back. Physical layout remains the same. I mentioned it multiple times in previous episodes, and this is super yeah. cool uh, observation. You can just delete rollback, begin delete rollback massively. This puts good pressure to your wall system, right? Check pointer, like it's cool. And uh, it means that, of course, uh, for vacuum, it won't do anything because transaction marked as uh, um, rolled back. So even X max is already updated. The, the the tuples survive, they still live. But Postgres generates a lot of wall for such workload. It also puts pressure to a backup system, to a replication system, and also a checkpointer it has a lot of work. So it means you are testing, like you, you can stress test many Postgres components just with this kind of workload. And I know we mentioned uh, last last week, right? We, we had yeah, Sai logical. as a guest. Yeah. I I suggest uh, who haven't uh, watched that episode, it's, it was super interesting discussion about logical replication with uh, PureDB founder Sai. Mm -hmm. So, and I mentioned that this is exactly how I found that we can easily reach and saturate single core on uh, wall sender. Wall yep. sender. So you just delete minerals, roll back. Delete minerals, roll back. It spams wall. And wall sender hitting 100% of single vCPU and uh, is becoming bottleneck quite quickly. Fortunately, on production, as I mentioned, we don't observe. I, I couldn't find such situation, but in non-production, it's easy to reproduce. So I, I found this very handy tool to, to stress test Postgres and, and for checkpoint or tuning and so on. That's yeah. why message delete not only bad, but also good. <laughs> but only being rolled back. Yeah, yeah. It's, isn't it isn't funny and like exciting that physical layout doesn't change of table? You delete well, it, roll it, back, but it's the same. This is one of those things where like if you talk to Oracle guys, you'll get them sweating by this point because of different uh, a different implementation. Because it's, right. it's it's only because Andor. of Postgres's specific MVCC implementation. Because yeah, because in Oracle they have the undo log. Right. It it it's like the opposite trade off. So it's right. it's so interesting that Postgres. the implementation details are so. It's good to know them in order to work out how to test things. Yeah, Postgres is uh, ex expecting you to perform rollbacks often. So. Yeah, I think it's good to make use of it when when it's adv advantageous. Right. So the tuple remains in the same s spot in the page doesn't go, doesn't shift, unlike in other systems, but still X, Xmax is updated. So page becomes dirty and must be flushed to disk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so makes sense. Yeah, I think we explored it quite well enough, quite deep. Uh, take over, take aways, yeah. key take, take aways. First, perform check pointer tuning, watch out our episode about that. Yeah. And uh, if you prohibit massive deletes, perform deletes and batches, uh, roughly like not longer than one or two seconds unless you don't have users uh, who like deal with your database a lot and maybe you can go with like 30 seconds in, the, in this case well or at least consider batching and yeah. uh try yeah uh, do well, some well, I, I just, I just wanted to have some rule and for regular ltp one second is a good rule yeah great i like it yeah, Good. I think it's like a healthy recommendation as well. Like even if you, you wouldn't go down or even if you wouldn't have like degradation of like that users would notice, it's just an unhealthy thing to do, like to, to go excessive. And then like, it's kind of like extremes where if you, if you can keep things more level, you probably see better uh, things. Yeah. Them. And a couple of more take takeaways is uh, mm -hmm. vacuum. Don't forget vacuuming, the regular vacuum. Effects about uh, index only scans we discussed. Maybe you want frequent and quite aggressive vacuum, like to go faster, more are you consumed. Uh, and also partitioning. Yeah. Maybe you, maybe your massive delete is just truncated. In this case, uh, all those negative effects uh, can go away. Yeah. Yeah, love it. Good. Thanks so much, Nikolai. 
Thank you, Michael. See you next time.